This is Tracy Drummond, archivist for the Southern Labor Archives at Georgia State University Library. I'm here with Diane Fleming. We are in Las Vegas for the Machinist uh, Retirees Convention. It is November 21st, 2013, and we are going to talk to Diane today about um, her history with the IAM. Welcome, Diane. Welcome. Thank you. And thanks for agreeing to sit with uh, me for an interview today. We'll jump right in. My pleasure. Where and when were you born? I was uh, born in Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. August 13, 1942. And, um, yeah. Okay. Well, and tell me a little bit about your childhood growing up there in childhood, Chicago. Childhood. Well, my father passed away when I was three years of age, so we in turn moved to Middlesboro, Kentucky which is in the southeastern part of the state of Kentucky, where Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky border, uh, with my um, mother's uh, parents, my grandparents. That's where um, my childhood and teenage, uh, until I went off to school. Okay. So. Are you an only child? No, I have um, another sister that, she was six months old, so my father never got to, uh, to see her. And then my mother remarried after uh, a number of years, so I have um, two, um, three other siblings. Her mom is deceased. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and so, do you remember anything about Chicago before you got to Kentucky? Very little. Um, actually, my grandparents lived in Evingston, mm -hmm. which is a suburb of Chicago, and I've gone back. Um, they eventually moved to Portland, Oregon, so uh, we would go visit, my sister and I would go visit them in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, I did go kind of try to find out the street that they lived on, but I very, I have some vague memory about about the, the growing up and, or the visits with my, um, my father's family there before their relocation. Do you mind if I ask what happened to your dad? Was he sick? Uh, it was service related. Um, he was in World War, I guess that would have been World War Two. Mm -hmm. Right and, at the end. Yeah, at the end. Um, he then contracted, um, I guess, malaria, then that led to tuberculosis and he just, um, I guess, it had gotten too far along, you know, to really um, be cured or anything, so that was, that was it. Well, I'm sorry that that happened when you were so young. Yeah. Um, so, you moved to Kentucky, which yes. is probably very different than Chicago, um, the part you were in, I would imagine. So what was your life like once you got there? Well, at three, you don't know oh, too yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my grandmother raised, we had chickens uh, in the backyard. Uh, it was a it's a segregated um, town, so um, there were um, different um, you know, sections of town um, where at that time it was called we were called coloreds. You know, we were not we keep changing our definition of what we are, <laughs> our race. But um, well, I think the big thing to point out there is that you've African Americans finally started saying this is what we will be called and not having white people call you what they want to call you. Exactly. You, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's a big But then, um, you know, I I'm, I'm found myself now using the term colored because that's what I think is more descriptive of, of our race because we are a, a multitude of, of colors and it, it's more appropriate, I think. So yeah. it's kind of funny. <laughs> But it was um, a very small town, population of about 14,500. Um, again, there were different sections of the city that um, our people lived. Um, some were a little bit the class. You know, we get into class structure within our own race, and I'm sure all races do that. Um, the school was first through the 12th grade. My mother went there, my aunts and everyone. So. <laughs> Um, and it was um, uh, my graduating class. There were twelve people in it, so that kind of tells you. And it was still segregated when you still segregated, okay. still segregated. Um, there was one movie theater we could go. We were allowed to go to, and you'd buy your tickets in the in the 
at the ticket office, but then you would have to go around and sit in the balcony, uh, which were actually the better seats. <laughs> and <laughs> um, there was no, no dining in any of the, the places, which was very limited anyway. Right. Um, but my grandfather was, um, he was a waiter. He had worked uh, on the railroad. He, had, um, he was a very well-educated um, uh, man, a uh, very small statue. Um, he was probably one of the only people in Middlesbrough that got the Congressional Journal that, you know, was very impressive. I didn't know what it's like, what is this, Granddad? Um, my grandmother was um, very, um, she was originally from Louisiana. And so there was a mixture of, of the race, I guess the Creole is what you would call, um, called our, our family. And it was, um, it was just, it was a, a good childhood from what I could remember. Um, I, did, I did know at an early age that this would not be the place that I would spend the rest of my really? life. Really? And that as soon as possible, I would be, I would be out of there. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up. Um, so that's that's kind of it. But it was um, the school was. We had some wonderful educators, and we were actually um, uh, exposed to many, many different um, uh, different pieces um, as far as we we had performances, uh, plays, uh, there were, um, uh, there was a limit with actually books or any type of materials like that, but you know, it was, things were implemented in so many ways. It was a well-rounded education for, um, for us. And I'm always amazed at some of the people from that town um, just kind of went, different places in the world and you know very very achieved mm, okay. so so mm. that's kind of that and growing up there I have to ask were there ever any incidences because you said it was a segregated town was it the kind of thing where there was just this mutual understanding that the white folks would stay in one part mm -hmm. of town the black folks right. would stay in one part of town or were there because I'm from the deep south I grew up in Georgia mm -hmm. and I no, there. Um, there were issues in some places. Mm -hmm. um, racist attacks, mm -hmm. things in lynchings mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that. And and we so never, so it I was never just, experienced that. I never understood because, um, again, like I said, there were some that were had a little bit. Everybody was kind of poor, you know. <laughs> Some were had a little bit more than others, and then we um, had people that lived next to us that were that had a lot less than we had that were of, of the white race. So it was very um, it was it was easy. My mom worked for um, one of the department stores there. She was um, in the stock uh, you know stock clerk, I guess is what they called it at the time, and. Uh, now I guess you would call it merchandising, merchandising assistant. Yeah. And then my um, my stepfather, he did um, numerous things. So we never, never experienced, I guess, or we were never actually exposed. You knew um, certain areas of the town that you just didn't go into, and and you sort of kept your boundaries. Which I think at that time segregation was a little bit more defined. And um, it wasn't as subtle as it is now because it's still very prevalent, and I think that it's actually um, declined uh, as far as um, the progression of integration mm -hmm. or acceptance of, of races. Mm -hmm. So um, I I did not understand though why we had um, you had to go to the colored restroom. There was one, the water fountain was for coloreds, and they were always so very unsanitary. So we were fortunate that we were able to travel to go, you know, to other places, 
And so it's like, well, I, I, I don't understand. Why do I have to sit here? Why do I have to go? And it's just, you know, do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was never, you know, totally explained to you about it. It was just that you knew these boundaries and you stayed within them. Okay. Yeah. So was your town integrated while you still lived there? Or had you moved away by the time and integration was away, sort of? Um, my sister was one of the first to go to, they had an integrated graduation. It was quote unquote so that the state could give school money, you know, to the, the white high school. But then after that, you know, there, there was integration. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what was expected of a young woman growing up in Kentucky in a smaller town? What, was, what, what, what hopes did your parents have for you? Um, well, my parents had, had been um, educated. They had gone to college, mm -hmm. and many of the people that we knew had, had gone on. Um, very few, there's still some, very few people um, stayed there. You know, you would go off to school, and then you, some would come back, um, like, the ones I grew up with. I think there's like one, one or two people that are still there in the in the town. Um, and I, what was expected is that you would um, further your education and that you would be able to take care of yourself and your family, and and, and that's kind of it as far as, um, and that's what I knew that mm -hmm. the plans for me would be. <laughs> um, okay. um, did you work while you were still in high school? Well, I did babysit for some white families. There was a, a pediatrician um, and um, my grandmother used to do ironing, you know, taking clothes. Mm -hmm. And so I um, would sometimes help her. And a couple times I went to a family and did I'm not sure what I was doing, but um, I guess it was maybe babysitting. That was about it. But there was okay. no, there was really no other type of employment there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when you graduated, I went off to um, Knoxville, Tennessee, which is about 65 miles. That's the the largest township or city near Middlesbrough, mm -hmm. and went to college there. Um, I did participate in the sit-ins. At, okay. um, at the um, was Riches, I don't know if Riches department store. We had no, we had we had yeah, we had yeah, those, we right. had the sit-ins in Atlanta. <laughs> the sit-ins, yeah, mm -hmm. at the counters there. I, I remember the marching, and I remember telling my mother after the fact, and she was a bit upset. And I guess it's because it's the, of the fear, but I didn't I didn't have that fear. It was like you know this is not right. And I, I was pretty, always pretty vocal as to why I don't understand, and and um, it, this is this is just not right. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of yeah. when you got your first activist exactly. leaning, exactly. perhaps. <laughs> well, um, what was your major? Um, it was in um, education. Education. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you work while you were in school? Did you have like a part time? No, because um, one of the one of the better things was because, and not better, but one of the opportunities given um, was that my, because of my father's death, military related, my sister and I um, were able to, um, you know, continue our education through the government, and that was an important part of Social Security, which, you know, they try, they're trying to cut all of those benefits. So that, that does help. Social Security is not just for older people. Right. It, it, it helps many, many families in other ways. So. And so that's something you were aware of even as a young woman, mm -hmm. that Social Security yeah. was helping you. Okay. Yeah. And, and then having these sit-ins and sort of mm -hmm. being away from home and growing into a young woman and getting your activist leanings. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about maybe uh, how, why it was important to you to become involved? Uh, for for fairness, just the, the right thing to do to treat people um, as you would want to be treated, give people the opportunity, um, and that um, it's it's just part of, of the way we should live. Did you have a lot 
of, or did you have any support from um, maybe more progressive white people in Knoxville at the time? Like joining mm-hmm. you for the sit-ins or anything like that? Not that I remember. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I guess I got pretty, I was pretty, um, maybe somewhat a little bit angry that, you know, you have to go through this and why? Mm-hmm. I would have been yeah. incredibly yeah. angry. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. I'm not the, um, I guess I'm not, I wasn't one of the, um, I would probably have laid more to um, some oh. of Malcolm's, X's way of viewing things rather than Dr. King, you know, with the passiveness and so forth. I never, I never had the the jail or the the dogs or the. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure that my personality would have been able to accept that because I would probably have <laughs> reacted a little bit differently. But with the sit-ins, you know, it was a, a very quiet, peaceful thing, and this was the right way to do it. Mm-hmm. And you never. Um, I guess it's just the respect that you have for yourself that you do not put yourself on the um, the same level as some of the people that are not um, as kind. Did yeah. you have people show up to um, sort of actively confront you about what you, you were know, doing? There was there were you know the lines that that you would have to just walk through mm-hmm. and and not pay any attention to. Mm-hmm. And you were given instructions as to, to, to how to do things. Okay. So it was very organized. Mm-hmm. It wasn't very organized. showing up. No. It was no. It was planned. Okay. Um, so you get through college, and right. did you start looking for a job? or? No, then I ended up, um, I did not graduate from there. I ended up coming to Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, my aunt and uncle were living there. And then my uh, my plan was to then to continue the education in Washington. Um, I planned to go to Howard. However, um, I I think it was the winter I had gotten one of my first jobs was with um, the Heck Company, which is uh, no longer it's now Macy's department store and gift wrap. Mm-hmm. And then um, I. Um, I guess became employed and school was kind of put on the back burner. And then when I came back to, I went back to Kentucky for that Christmas and then when I came back to, to Washington they had, I guess it was, um, they had terminated the employment or it was seasonal at okay. the time. So okay. I ended up, um, the second the second employment was um, National Geographic um, magazine and their other publication department other than the magazine they do other uh, printed publications so I became assistant analyst there but I had applied for other jobs and at the time you were considered overqualified if there were a quote of, of blacks that had already been hired so that was the term you know well you're overqualified uh, try this or try that so you know um, so knit um, this is leading up to my United career. I guess I was with National Geographic for maybe a year or two years. Okay. And I was, my aunt said, oh, we hear that United Airlines is hiring. So um, you had to first be pre-interviewed by the Urban League and then sent out to, yeah. yeah this They wanted to make sure that the applicants were um, qualified and that there would be no reason why you should not be able to hire people. Okay, so, so oh, okay, so they didn't want a company run by white people to have an excuse to say no. They wanted to, right. to they, like pre-interview and make sure. That okay. We were sending a person out that, you okay. know, why, why can't okay. you hire this person? Mm-hmm. So I, I did that, I went to... Um, and. I'm sorry, tell me again about what year would that have been? Um, well, with United it was 1963 is when I was hired. Okay, you were April hired of 1963. Okay. So these other jobs were um, two or three years before that. Okay. Um, I graduated at 16. I was kind of early, <laughs> early years. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow, yeah. Okay. And um, so I applied for a flight attendant because that's kind of all I knew about the airline industry. and. I was then advised that, well, um, 
I was very thin and that I was not outgoing enough. So to go into the reservations department, well, at that time they were making more money than white attendants. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then to come back in six months and reapply for a flight attendant that I should be ready by then. Well, the whole thing is they had to have their quota of people that they needed in that position. Mm -hmm. So um, so I was, I was hired myself and another woman from, um, she was actually from New York, no, from Detroit, but she had relocated to Washington. Is this too long? No, no. I'm 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 just always checking to make sure okay. it's recording correctly yeah. and that it's still moving. So um, we were two of the first persons initially hired directly from the street, as you would say it, um, for United, mm -hmm. and uh, it was we were very well received, um, except that they would get us confused with the names. <laughs> Um, I was Carter at the time, and she was Jenkins, and yeah, um, and you know we looked nothing alike. Our personalities were nothing alike, and it's like no, no, no. But finally, um, it was some of the you know really just wonderful people, and we were just uh, openly received. And you know at that time, some of our best friends were white. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it was, you know, that was, that was it. Mm -hmm. And I never went on back to f apply for, uh, to become a flight attendant. <laughs> what were some of your duties um, doing reservations? And, and, and I'm sure that if you started there in 63, over the years you saw the technology change yeah, the a lot too. Yeah, the technology we had. Um, so what was the, res a res how would a reservation be done? Uh, it would be called in, you would have um, a paper card that you would fill out um, and the first we had um, a, sort of a um, very limited type computer but you would key things in and then you would give the fare and the names and so forth and you would send it down this little running belt and then it would go to what was called a sort and the people would sort alphabetically by flight number by flight numbers and you know um, destinations and and names and so forth. Um, then it finally it progressed to tickets by mail. That was, I guess, the first real part of ticketing because it, you had ticket offices, lots of ticket offices at the time, and people would go in. And then um, there were different areas of the reservation department um, for rates and, um, but it was pretty basic United you know, uh, uh, market was was limited. I mean, nothing like today. But you know, the main thing was to Chicago, and then you went on from Chicago to other places. So it was it was a lot of manual um, manual activity, and there were shifts. And, um, I don't know if we had twenty four hour shifts. I know there was a, a midnight to morning. Yeah, there was twenty four hours someone there. Okay. So. Okay. And then, you know, the seniority was, was put in place. Okay. Um, seniority was put in place even before you got the union. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Were y'all under the railway? Did y'all have to do things according to the Railway Act? Um, possibly. I you didn't, you didn't have, no, no, have no idea. <laughs> what was the dress code like for young women? Oh, that was quite interesting. At the time um, I began, you could only wear... Um, skirts or dresses, no pants. Then we were finally allowed to wear pantsuits, but then the uh, jacket had to cover your butt, your buttocks. Okay. Yeah, so um, the dress code, and that was even in, in the reservations department. Um, I, was, I just lost a thought there about something about that. But um, yeah, that was, that was quite interesting with the, with the dress code. Oh, it was a retirement. You could not join the retirement plan until you were twenty for females until you were twenty five. So that because do they expect that you would have a husband and be on his plan or um, I don't know. Okay. But you were not eligible for retirement for the retirement plan. You were also not um, as far as because I did then become married and had children. Their maternity leave. You were not guaranteed your job when you came back to um, to work. If there was an opening available you were then 
uh, allowed to return. Did you lose your seniority? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I might have. Mm. I don't know. That was like, <laughs> I'm 71 now. She can see so old. <laughs> you don't look good. Um, you don't look so that was, that was like many years. But okay. then I think the um, insurance, insurance did not cover um, that. Okay. Uh, I think they covered like $250 for um for your medical expenses and and at birth of a, a child. Okay. And then the leave was I think it was six weeks that you were allowed. And again that was based on the available if you if yeah. there was a job opening at the time. So did, but you were able to go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and so, so you, those all those over the years those benefits have been improved and then of course with the union that did bring about many changes. And so you had Lisa in 65 mm -hmm. and Lewis in 67. Mm -hmm. And um, let's, so let's talk about them um, for, just a, for just a minute. Have you sort of instilled any of your activist leanings in these? Sorry. It, no, no, that's uh -huh. fine. It happens. Uh, I'm going to need to call you back. Uh, I'm going to need to call you back. Uh, the probably, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my son is a little more um, very vocal and um, than my daughter in, in his views. Um, and his activism. Mm -hmm. He is with the Smithsonian and they do have a union and I was just, <laughs> and I was, um, and he, he has some of his colleagues come to him for advice and so forth. So I've been trying to get him. I said, well, you know, you should become a leader. And he says, the union, this union is not very good. <laughs> it doesn't. Mm. It's, is he um, with a maybe nephew or? Ask me or something. Or, okay. Yeah, it's not One, or, very strong. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I still, but he doesn't uh, balk or he doesn't step aside. You know, if something's right, he's very. I guess both of them have very strong. If they have very strong views on something, they do um, reflect that. So that's that's part of something that if you really believe in something. That I tried to instill, you know, you just you just go for it. Just, you're not always right sometimes, and you know you do have to give a little bit. But right, yeah. Okay. Okay. And so Lisa is in. Um, she's been in the Air Force, and um, she's. I think she has two more years before retirement. She actually has her 20 years, but she has um, the other her last tour added on. So she's currently in. Biloxi, Gulfport, Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Do you get down there to gamble? I have never been there. They have. That's know, where so my parents go. <laughs> so when she um, got, you know, it's like Mississippi because she'd had some wonderful tours. Uh -huh. um, Masawa, Japan, um, Lake and Heath in England, uh, Germany, and so forth. So uh, we had um, travel to those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she has four children. Uh, nice. Yeah. My son is not married or with children. Okay. But both of them, are, you know, yeah. and I think some of the the grandchildren, at least, they have very strong feelings or views about things, so mm -hmm. they uh, they do express that. Okay. Very good. So um, back to your job at United. So you started there in '63, but you were telling me that it was probably closer to 1980 before you got a union before the it union would, organized you right and it may even yeah it was closer to that okay yeah. so what so what sort of started happening that made you guys feel it would be important to organize the, the well, I think because we did have the our mechanics that were organized um, all, every group was organized except us and so the mm -hmm. machinists came um, and I believe that the, the also at the other time you know there were other unions trying to organize us but because mm -hmm. Our machinists were with the, uh, the IAM. We went with them, and that was it. And it was, you know, for the 
for um, certain rights and and better um, benefits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the whole time you were there, you worked in reservations. Mm -hmm. No, the, yeah. I began reservations. That's right. And then I went to the city ticket office. And and just and explain what a city ticket office All right. is. That would, people would come in and purchase their tickets. That was before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, or you know, the tickets by mail. That was one of the first way of, of getting your ticket. But um, they would come in and plan their itineraries. As we would um, have your international travelers with. In, which would be a more extensive itinerary that you might have to do pricing on and uh, the tickets were initially handwritten because our ticket off ticket uh, ticketing personnel with the tickets by mail they would have to we had paper tickets and you would have to write these tickets you know um, out before the computer days. And then um, that would be the same at the ticket office. And then it got a little more um, advanced with technology. And so now we have the e-ticket. Yeah. So I've seen, you know, the whole <laughs> progression. Yeah. Of that. Um, so then once um, at the ticket office, I did have two, I had um, a, an assignment to go to Sao Paulo, Brazil and that was to open a ticket office there because Pan American United had merged with Pan American, okay. who took over the their routes, the international some of their international routes, especially South America and Central America. So that was no, that was that a two month. That was, might have been a two month assignment. How was that? That was just that was so incredible. That was <laughs> wonderful. Speak no Spanish, no Portuguese, yeah. <laughs> only English, which is, you know, not the greatest of the but it was just a wonderful working crew because then, you know, the the persons that we were training were bilingual. So they helped a lot. And mm -hmm. you know, we um it was just a good experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have some memorabilia from Pan Am when we took over their, their office. Mm -hmm. Um, then I also had an assignment in um, Guatemala, you know, for the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was you got that to was travel. Good. Yeah. Um, during strikes, though, am I advancing too far? Well, I wanted to go back. How did? How? What kind of pushback did you get from management when you guys were trying to organize? I mean, did they sort of? Say, well, we don't really want that to happen, but we see that these people are organized and these people are organized. Yeah. And so that was limiting, and I guess as far as the um, the meetings or you know when you would, yeah, I, I think so. I, I just remember it being very um, the way the cards initially were handed out. You know how we had to be very careful about doing the the proper thing, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't. Management was pretty cool at the time, I think, mm -hmm. and so we didn't get a lot of, on, on our level, I mm -hmm. don't remember a lot of, um, of things that were, that we were really, I guess you were just cautious. There Now there were people within our own organization, you know, that were against the union, mm -hmm. and we just, you know, well, we don't understand, you know, like, like co-workers who co didn't want, okay. yeah, our colleagues, some of mm -hmm. our colleagues that mm -hmm. didn't necessarily want, didn't see any benefit of a union. Okay. Did the environment change once you organized? Was there, did it, did the workplace feel different mm -hmm. or? No, no, I, okay. don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, it was a pretty, it was a pretty congenial group of people and, um, they, you know, you, you, you got along pretty well, yeah. And then once the people that were, they saw the benefits, I guess, they received, then uh, it made it better. Okay. Yeah. So I, don't, I didn't see a lot of division with management and non-management at the time. Okay. Any more than before. Okay, okay. But you would mention to strike. Well, then this is when the company, uh, you know, we had we had strikes mm -hmm. because of um, 
And I didn't, I guess I didn't, because we were new to the union, we did not know a lot of the like negotiations and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. But in many, we did know that there were going to be some things that were going to be better for us. And um, so when the um, mechanics would strike, then, you know, we would also be on strike as well. But at the time, there were reciprocal agreements with the other airlines. For um, example, American Air, they would hire they would hire the reservations people to um, come to their workplaces because they were so that inundated because United was so large. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one time I went up to Hartford, Connecticut, um, and worked for American, and then you were paid. You were given your salary, you were given a pre diem and accommodations. So, wow. <laughs> okay, this is sweet. <laughs> uh, the children were little, but they were with their father, so that was good. Okay. But then um, other, another time, was it, was it American again? I think um, I stayed local or either Delta, you know. So it would depend on which airlines some of the people went to work for Piedmont at the time. Uh, you may not even know about that. I might, I don't remember no. Piedmont. <laughs> yeah, it was a southern carrier. Okay. But um, that, that um, those things happened too. So okay. the, the whole industry was a lot, lot different than today. Okay, yeah. all right. So, so you're saying that a lot of the strikes came about more because you guys weren't really equipped to negotiate well, or, we were we were out because say, the machinists would go out. So so it was a sympathy strike. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. so was, you so never we were, struck for your own group. No, we okay. were part of the machinists, and then you know one on strike, we were all on strike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any stories about that, or did any of those last a long time, or? No, yeah, they it's, one did last a few quite a, a couple months. Okay. Yeah. Did y'all have a good strike fund to sort of help folks out? Um, well, I wasn't, again, I had gone to work for another airline, so I was still okay financially. Okay. Yeah, so okay. we, um, our, I guess we didn't have the impact that maybe some of the other other folks had. Okay. You know, you so know. after that strike was over, mm -hmm. would you leave that job? Was it just temporary and go back to? Oh yeah. yeah okay. So yeah. you always came back to United. Yeah. Or yeah, this was just like on, whatever. Say like a loan. They would loan X number of people, whoever wanted to go to, to say American to mm -hmm. help help with them. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Because you yeah. think, you think that the. Um, well, that was before the competition was just that. Yeah. That uh, cutthroat, I guess, okay. is the word. Yeah. Because it's, 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 it's kind of, you can tell, it's sort of hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that we're striking against you, but you're going to send us somewhere where we can make some money while we're on strike. Yeah. Like that. Well, your group is on strike. Yeah. You know, so we're striking against the company. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, the other airlines are going to make, you know, we're, yeah. it was all about, I guess, two people, you know, trying to accommodate the people for travel. Mm -hmm. When I think about it, who yeah. were those two people? Mm -hmm. That was the people, you oh. know, passengers. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, you said two people trying to accommodate. Oh no, it was I meant for trying to accommodate people, not to. Oh, you know, okay. The the airline trying to accommodate. to accommodate. Okay, you know, I passengers. see. Passengers. That's okay. what I was trying to yeah, get that. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really kind of interesting how that that whole thing happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so did you learn more about the union as the years, what what year did you actually, may I ask, what year did you, you actually the retire? Uh, I think I've been retired for about 10 or 12 years now. Okay, so mm -hmm. maybe around 2000, 2001. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Um, so you were with United for a long time. Mm -hmm. Was United still an airline when you retired, or had they already? Yeah, that was United. Was still that was before the uh, the merger with Continental. Okay. Yeah, no, um, one of the the past uh, Stephen Wolf 
Stephen Wolf was a real, oh, I should not talk about people. But he would just come in and just, just pretty much rape your carriers. He had some other airlines before United that he became um, CEO. And he tried to um, do a merger with US Air at the time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the millions that were spent on trying to do the merger. And then the management, it was all about him and management and selling the airlines off. Um, United survived, uh, but um, then after that, you know, we went through the financial, um, the employee uh, ownership, uh, where our salaries were, um, we made concessions, the concessions with, with salary and um, which was to be part of your retirement but the only time you could get that, the stock that was put in stock, was that, you know, if you left the company, if you, so it was it was very similar to the, the Enron thing, you know, you mm -hmm. you could get your stock, but you could only get it if you left, you know, you couldn't say take pieces of it out at a time, and then they had did have a stock purchase plan, so I I you know, through payroll done done that. But then at the, the end results is that the pension plan, United stopped paying into it, so now um, we, re retirees, like in my era, our pension is, is paid by the, um, the Pension Control Board or the Pension Guarantee Board, okay. PG, whatever. What did, and so were they put in place to cover pensions when? Mm -hmm, when, when companies default. Okay. Yeah. So you know. So it's like insurance, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's it's sort of. Um, so as a result of that, you know, the pensions were not what you thought you were going to get when you retired. You didn't, mm -hmm. because of of the way things were handled, and it was you kept making the concessions, and it um, you never recovered from that. Mm -hmm. So you thought you were going to get say 30 or 40,000 when things went back, then they filed bankruptcy, so they reorganized and, you know, it went in on a different level. So that's, um, but fortunately because of the union, you know, you, some things were able to, to be kept in place. Right, because you, know? you had some folks fighting yeah. for you. Right. Um, well, before we move on, is there anything, because you said you were shop steward, or the equivalent of a shop mm -hmm. steward in yeah. your... So what were some of the things people would bring to you working in that kind of environment? I guess it was mainly about our scheduling because mm -hmm. um, we were a small operation and uh, we had different locations. And then, you know, with sometimes uh, with the, the management and the little inner um, personality things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you retired around 2001. Is there anything else you want to say about your time with United or any of that work or being in the union or anything that maybe we didn't cover or I didn't ask about? No, no, no. I probably forgot a lot of things, but I think we did the highlights of... Yeah. Yeah. It was a good career, okay. good company to, to work for. Mm -hmm. um, many things have changed in the, the industry. I really sympathize with the with the people now that work for an airline. That you know, your the pay is low. The benefits, you know, our benefits were cut considerably mm -hmm. um, with the merger. So we, you know, you used to be able to get unlimited uh, travel benefits as an employee. Um, even retired and your seniority was counted for now it's like we're at the bottom of the list really? so. so that was flights like you could get so many flights a year for free is mm -hmm. that what you mean as many as you wanted yeah really as the employee and then we also for um we, they had companion tickets mm -hmm. that you could get 24 that would be um per segment so if you did a round trip that would be two of those okay every year and that you could just you know, give them to, to whomever. Now all that's changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. 
Um, I, I don't think, I, I would recommend um, a union because if there had not been a union in place at the time, we would have really been just like out the door, <laughs> you know, with, yeah. with very, with nothing. And even, even now, I think that it's, it's so important that uh, we keep our unions in place and that we try to, that we must um, increase our, our membership. We should go out, out for different other um, areas of the, the workforce, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe had not been traditional. Have you ever been to the Wimpusinger Center to mm -hmm. take classes? I've taken classes. And they've got all the great um, displays there, different mm -hmm. things people make. Yeah. So yeah. I always, I was surprised. I, I don't have a union background, yeah. um, but that machinists make everything from rifles to mm -hmm. yeah. to spaceship or not spaceship. That sounds yeah. like aliens, but you know, yeah. like right, like know. like space shuttles, <laughs> the shuttles to yeah. condoms to so Harley Davis. You know right. what I? Yeah. This, Coverages and companies yeah. that do those things. Yeah, some yeah. of the, some of the products are just amazing. Yeah, yeah I've done um, a number of classes down there, which is a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's a wonder, yeah, it's a wonderful place to go. So you retired around two thousand one, and but you, that was been about twelve years now. Mm -hmm. And, but you're still very active with the union as a retiree. As a retiree. And so was it important for you to continue to be active or just, just based on your early um, years of activism when you, were, when you were a young woman or is it something that you, you know, did you say this is something I'm going to do or did you retire and then see a void that needed to be filled? And no, then no, step I didn't in? have any voids. <laughs> I didn't have any voids, uh, as you could probably see with my other activities and organizations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm quite involved with um, my community, my church, and um, and then this was um, just important that that we as retirees organize, you know, because we still have to make a difference, mm -hmm. and because the majority of our population is um, aging. We have the majority here, and it's about a voice that we have to leave legacies for our our youth. Mm -hmm. um, so I get under Maria Cordoni, mm -hmm. she started the Young Machinist program, mm -hmm. and I believe you're participating in that here. Um, no, I was not on one of those you panels. Not, you were no, not one we, of those um, have, you, have you done that before? Myself and Susan Taylor, mm -hmm. um, we kind of, Maria took us under her wings. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there, I don't think there were a lot of women in the retiree organizations, mm -hmm. and then women of color. So we were kind of like, okay, we're going to do this, and we want, I want you all to get involved. And we just, like, it's just so good mm -hmm. it's um, enjoyable the people that you meet and then you know it's for a cause yeah yeah so and you say she took you under her wing um, or her wings mm -hmm. to and sort of mentor the exposure, you the, yeah, the mentor the exposure and, and exactly guidance, totally guidance. And, okay with the, you know the classes and, and so forth okay um, it was a wonderful opportunity to go to the um, the nomination in Denver for uh, President Obama. And nomination for the second term or the first? The first, the, the first very term. first one. Yeah. yeah, and we had. Um, Did you get to meet him? No, but we were right there in the front. You know where that mm -hmm. blue carpet was. Yeah, yeah, we had seats there. They told us well, we've got some special seats that folks had arranged right. and that was just one of the most incredible experiences of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, four years ago we were in Ohio, did the campaigning there and then this last, I mean eight years, so the last yeah. two campaigns yeah. we, were, we went to Ohio. Okay. And then, 
the driving around, meeting people, knocking on doors. And, yeah. uh, and that's sort of, let me say, just typically, when, there, when it's not a big election year, mm -hmm. what are some of the typical activities you do as a member of the IAM retirees? Well, I've gotten, um, with the Alliance, we're members of the Alliance, and so... The Alliance I for have, Retired Americans? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to put that down there. <laughs> and I have been called upon to um, go and do testimony on the Hill, uh, with regard to Social Security and Medicare and rights for seniors. And so I've had a few um, meetings <laughs> and some press coverage. <laughs> and one time I was even on, uh, interviewed on one of the radio station in Ohio. We were, we were at Whippen Singer. And mm -hmm. then another time I was down there for a class and then I came into D.C. and um, met with some of the, it was another press conference or for rights to work and so forth. So, um, Rich's fiesta, fiesta, yeah, his, um, you know, it's like, Diane, can you, can you go talk for us or whatever? And they usually give me a, a script and, and, nice. and I had lived, so. Yeah. Um, but they send you out to sort of be their spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. That's and nice. so, you know, part of it is my story about my father and Social Security benefits, how they help families and what, yeah. uh, it's not just for older people and then my mother and just you know your own personal stories and how the benefits have helped and and how they're needed and there's no need for cuts or any of those things so so that part has you know we've become quite involved in, okay. and and you're in the DC area so mm -hmm. you're close to the yeah, I'm right, in, I'm right in the city quarters yeah or the Grand Lodge right, right. right. yeah okay. All right, and um, but then specifically, you were saying last year, two thousand twelve, um, Ohio was a swing state, mm -hmm. and they weren't sure if they were going, if it was gonna, you know, the the votes were gonna go to Romney or Obama, and uh, talk a little bit about how y'all decided to go in and work in that area. Well, we were we were called. It was a group of us that had worked the the previous election, and um, they needed people in Ohio. And we started out in Akron on this last time, and then, you know, it was Akron. Then we ended up that they needed more people in Toledo. So we went to Toledo, and we were there for four weeks, five weeks, and came, we, I drove, um, and I just had thyroid surgery for mm -hmm. cancer, and so I was like, oh, I'm, yeah, well, I'm going to do this. And I was like, yes, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> and I, um, um, yeah, so it was, it was the group that had worked together before and then some additional people. And we were with the, um, the a, uh, AFL. I think it was, we, just, mm -hmm. we were out of their hall. And you were given an assignment every day. And I don't know if you know Sam. Did you meet Sam? Rodriguez? I have met Sam. I didn't yeah. interview him, but I did meet him. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we were kind of partners with the with the driving and Susan and a few others. So we had our, our core group, and it made a difference. There were areas that you went into. I mean, I remember one one time it was this off the main road, and this little dirt road, the driveway. And this guy in this truck, and he had this chain and this dog, and he said, we tried to say what we were there for. He said, you know, you all just need to get the hell out of here. Mm. And so it was like there was nowhere to turn around. I was so, I was like, oh, Sam, what are we going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to back up. I was like, oh. Down the back, um, up back up dirt road. And I see all this dirt road. And it's like, oh, goodness. And there were some people that were not receptive at all, and then there were others that were just openly warm. And and y'all targeted mainly union members, right? Uh, yeah, we did that, and then, um, you know, we kind of... There were some times we could, we could address, depending on what area we were covering, that you could cover um, uh, the president. And then the day of... Um, the early voting because you wanted to get people out for early voting because you did not want the lines or the wait for as long as it had been in the previous election. Mm -hmm. So the early voting, there were other propositions going on 
uh, with the gerrymandering, and they were trying to get that changed, but it didn't pass because people weren't, it was a very long proposition, and it was not an easy one to explain, you know, to, to bring it down to the basic, but once people understood, you know, they, they voted for it, but it, so that was a, um, that was an experience with the early voting that we went to the poll on that Sunday and, mm -hmm. and talked to people and, and then, um, you know, some of the areas, um, people were very warm and, you know, they'd already voted and, and, and so forth, so. Um, I would definitely do it again yeah. and again. Yeah? Yeah. And um, so in addition to being active with the retirees, you mentioned earlier um, you're um, active with the Campbell AME Church. You're a trustee. Mm -hmm. And the Anacostia Garden Club, mm -hmm. you're the president. Yes. And what does the garden club do? Well, we, <laughs> we plant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you say like neighborhood plantings, right, we beautification? Have beautification, and one of the former members is now deceased. And our theme is beautification depends on you, and I love flowers and and the beauty of of that. So um, that's what we do. Okay. Um, we also have a annual tree lighting with another organization I belong to. We do a holiday tree in the park, and we 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 dress that. Um, or decorate it and the fire department helps because it's gotten tall over the years mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's there for the season. Okay, so it's the um, Far Southeast, Far Southeast Strength Family Strengthening Collaborative. Family Strengthening Collaborative. Families, okay. yeah, so we work with families and um, Yeah, for um, we have like a fatherhood initiative, fathers with their children, and it's you know benefiting families and keep families together, and that's the most important mm -hmm. thing. You know that leads to um, just other positive things. Homeless families trying to find employment and uh, places to live, and so forth. So that's what that organization is about. Okay. Um, the other one is the Anacostia Economic Development, mm -hmm. and that's about economic development in our area. We also uh, provide a, we have a scholarship foundation, which I have to leave Friday, tomorrow, because our benefit is on Sunday, okay. and I'm the chairperson of that. Okay. So. <laughs> so you raise money, you have an event every year, right. and you raise money for the scholarships. Right, we have two major events, a golf tournament and the um, a, a brunch uh, okay. to raise monies for the scholarship, which go for four years as long as the student qualifies. Okay, so yeah. they're for college. Yeah, they're for, for college. Wow. Yeah. And is there how much for the four years? Uh, I can go anywhere from 500 to 2,500 per, per year. year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, and fair? A uh, fair lawn. Fair, fair lawn. lawn. That's okay. the area that, yeah. Um, that I live in. Citizens Association. Association. Yeah. So you're the past president of that and the current treasurer. Yeah. And that's just like a neighborhood organization. Yeah, it's our community organization okay. for a certain radius of, of, of where we live. Okay. Yeah. And what kind it's, of activities do y'all? It's We're very active with um, um, political issues, mm -hmm. um, betterment of the community, um, zoning, just, you know, issues of our community and city. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you are indeed busy. Yeah. And so I've been involved with, um, we have um, Ward 8. The district is divided into wards. We have 1 through 8, and I live in Ward 8. Um, and so we have the uh, Ward 8 Democrats. So I'm a member of that. Okay. And I forgot that, I guess. Um, then I was the past, let's see, our state committee, which would be all of the wards, and it's sort of a body of, well, the district does not have voting rights. Right. So um, this state committee is a group 
of activists uh, that represent all the different wards and part of the city. So I was actually in Brazil at the time when I was elected to that office. I wasn't even there. That is an elected <laughs> office. You have to run for that. But I'm pretty, um, stay pretty connected politically as well. Not as much as I used to. But, you know, some things you just have to let go for a minute. Yeah, yeah, a minute or two. Yeah. So, um, you're still an activist. Mm -hmm. You're still supporting education. Mm -hmm. And this has sort of been a, your life. Yeah. This is sort of, you found a way to do these things yeah. throughout your life. Um, what is one of the most important things for you about um, being in the union? Or not one, what are the most important things? In the, union. the solidarity that that is and just the, the beliefs um, and that and helping people all people yeah as having seen the world segregated and, and the world or not the world but yeah <laughs> you know what I mean um, our country with with the different um, with the segregation and the integration, and you sometimes wonder what is best. But the union, you know, it, it takes in all people, and then it's just about helping people. I mean, some of the stories here, you think that you have difficulties in life. I mean, I've been talking to some of the, the, our, our attendees, and they are just, it's just incredible. It is so incredible that the, the things that they have gone through and they're still they're still active and mm -hmm. they still have they believe a strong beliefs the right the right thing to do mm -hmm. yeah okay. well have we not covered anything or is there anything else you want to say or any particular people you want to mention that you you know it's been just a, a wonderful experience um, exposure the exposure that I've had Working with the retiree organization is has just been so um, so eye opening. Yeah, I guess that's that's kind of it. You know, it's a different world. You know, and I, I think we as people we limit ourselves. And we don't know what's possible. You know, there's something new every day. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but Maria, Charlie, and, and, and the other people that are in, one thing I, I found, and I think maybe Susan, that um, I didn't really know that much about the structure of the union, <laughs> and that, you know, you have, the, you know, tell, I think we had asked people, you know, explain this to me um, about your vice presidents, your reps, and this and that, and most of the people that we have worked very closely with have been actually officials, you know, they've been on higher levels, uh -huh. and you're like, so here we are, what did you all do? Well, we're just members. <laughs> you're not just um, members, though. Well, that's kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the point, right. isn't yeah. it? That yeah, that's it, that's it. We're all, we're all here for the cause. Uh -huh. and, and the union is, so, you know, it's, it's somewhat about, with, it's, it's about rights, about rights. Uh -huh. And we, had, we would not be to this point with with benefits, with vacation, with pay, and which is now trying to be destroyed. So, you know, things were work in cycles and and the order. But I don't know. Okay, I don't know. So, anything else? I think that's it. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for sitting with me today and talking to me yeah. about your life and career. I very much enjoyed it. Well, now we'll turn thank off the you. recorder. Okay, we're back. We're one, back. one of the first things that when I, when, when I had planned my retirement and I was going to get um, at the number the money that the concessions that I had made with United I was going to buy a PT cruiser. They had just come out, and I was going to work at the conservatory, the botanical gardens. Well, I did get my shirt for the botanical gardens, and I passed security yeah. and all of that, but. I never became employed because I just like, oh, the schedule here, it's not gonna work for me. Um, and didn't buy a PT Cruiser, you know. Yeah. But um, I do um, work a little part-time in a consignment shop on Sundays. Nice. I normally uh, 
maybe make more purchases than I get paid for. And also um, with the um, uh, DC Convention Center, mm -hmm. Destination DC, um, when we have conferences, made large conferences, um, work as maybe a uh, registration person, uh, fill bags or um, the restaurant desk and so forth. And those are just usually maybe three, four, five day. So flexible things yeah, that work flexible, with your yeah, schedule. Exactly. So, you know, I'm still, um, still out there in the workforce. Okay. And, um, yeah. Just can't stop. Yeah, can't stop. <laughs> can't stop. And then our, my, my mother has um, Alzheimer's, so we're, tr you know, trying to fit that in your family schedule. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's kind of such a devastating disease. And then, yeah. My grandmother yeah. had it, so yeah. I, yeah. I know. So, so that's, I think that ends that part, Tracy. Okay. I did remember that. Okay.